Finally, one last thing. As we saw, in order to determine the natural frequency using the measured damped natural frequency, we need to measure the damping ratio directly. So one way to do that is with, uh, with this method that I'll show that's called the uh, log decrement method. The thing to keep in mind um, is with damping, unlike with a spring, for example, uh, the only way to measure damping is dynamic, dynamically. You, you know, with a spring, right, you can hang the spring statically and put forces, statically measure deflection, and you can come up with a stiffness. With damping, you have to have motion, right, because the force of a damper only makes itself known when you've got relative velocity of its ends. If this damper is just sitting still there, there's no way for you to assess what its damping characteristics are, right? And um, so what we do is we, we refer to the model. So from the model for the under damp response, right, and I'm just reminding you of that equation here, um, just rewriting it here to show you that, that uh, this looks like kind of a damped cosine, but with some phase here. Don't be so concerned about that. The main point is, is this amplitude is a constant, right? This A naught, which here's, if you, if you do all of the, uh, if you re-derive this in terms of the cosine with phase, the A naught is constant. It depends on the initial conditions, and it's a damped exponential, right? So that's a very useful thing. We end up not really caring about the phase for what we're going to do next. So the important result here is that the amplitude of the response follows this decaying exponential, which is something that's useful to us. Right? So what we can do then is look at now at just the peaks, kind of like the way we did with uh, in an in a, in a earlier experiment with the pendulum. Right? You can just look at the peaks and you could discern something about dissipation, you recall. Now we're looking at this amplitude decay and by using the analytical solution, we can see that the ratio between two cycles, between two peaks, A, let's say, let's say N is the number of one peak, and then the next one is A sub N plus one, you can show that that ratio is simply the exponential, zeta omega N, and the time between those. Now, the thing to note is that this time difference is something that we can measure, right? This is also something that we can measure. So the period between those peaks, this difference here, turns out to be the, nat the damped natural period, right? And remember, that's related to the damped natural frequency, which is this expression here, right? Omega n, 1 minus zeta squared. So see, it depends on zeta, right? That's a nice result. So if you now take the log of both sides of this equation, having replaced this time difference with this relation, right, then everything turns out seems like to be a, a linear relation. The natural log of the amplitude ratios, right, is some constant. Look at this. It only depends on damping ratio times the, the cycle number, right? So if you plot the log of the amplitude ratio as, as a function of cycle number, the slope gives you zeta, right? Stated here, this shows that the log of the amplitude ratios, what we call the log decrement, is linearly related to the cycle number by a factor that's simply a function of zeta, okay? So here's what some example decays would look like. Just say if you were just looking at plots of these. Actually, the one on the right here should look familiar. Actually, this is pendulum data. With, and you recall that pendulum had damping that was not linear. And it had linear decay. <laughs> so the nonlinear friction gave us a linear decay. That, that was kind of a unique aspect of that. But when the system has linear damping, you actually get an exponential decay, right? That's what that model says. So. This shows you that without even doing any analysis on the data, if you plot response, say you just deflect the system, let it go, and you see an exponential decay, that should tell you that the system is probably linear. If you get a linear decay, it's dominantly nonlinear, right? 
Now we don't know we want to quantify this and in order to quantify that we have to do a little bit more work but at least again from just insight and from observation this is a good lesson to take away here right exponential decay dominantly linear linear decay dominantly nonlinear okay so when you plot now let's quantify this when you plot that log decrement as a function of n this now quantifies what we just said the linear case is going to have a nice linear relationship between the log decrement and cycle number, whereas that linear decay, actually, you get a non-linear relationship between log decrement. So this one you would say, oh, I cannot model this system with linear damping, right? Whereas this one, if you have a straight line, I, I can model this with linear damping. And this slope here is related to zeta. It's not zeta, it's actually beta. And so you, you take the number from here, that's beta, and then you could solve this simple quadratic equation for zeta, okay? Um, and um, you, know, you could do this a lot of ways. You could collect your signal, drop the signal into Excel, and do all this analysis. Let me show you another way to do that. Here's a um, little VI, and I've actually given this to you. Um, and it has a sub VI under here, and I'm going to actually show you the block diagram, but I'm not going to show you the code that generates this because I want you to re rebuild this. I want you to take the one I've posted this VI here without the code for just so that you practice uh, and uh, with that analytical solution, but uh, look at what this, um, let me explain what this VI does. You give it an initial condition, you give it a zeta value, you give it initial uh, position, initial velocity, which usually will release this from zero, so I'm making that zero. You give it some time parameters. It's not running a simulation, it's actually just computing the amplitude, the deflection from the analytical solution, right? So you're gonna just use that formula. So you don't need to run a simulation. I give it a mass, and these could be the masses of your system, right? So whatever mass you estimate, you put the stiffness in here, you put the, the, the mass, give it a zeta value. And what it does underneath is it calculates what that B is. But then what it also does is it, is, is it, it, it illustrates the use of this little VI that I've given you, which what that VI does is it takes this decaying signal and it picks off those peaks. I'm going to give it a little bit larger initial condition so you can see. So see what it's doing? The red points indicate that it's found those peaks. What it does then is it shoves that signal into a little VI. That VI actually finds those peaks, takes the amplitude ratio of those, plots it versus cycle number, and generates this graph, right? And, and then what it does is does a linear regression on that, finds that slope, solves the quadratic, and pumps out zeta. So over here, I put in a zeta of 0 0.01, and my log decrement VI is giving me 0 0.01. On a real signal, expect that, you know, this can depend on number of points you've collected. It could also, if there's noise here, you know, this may not, this is a nice perfect signal. So you, you can get some, you know, noise in this graph too. So, but uh, check this out if I, when I run this continuously, if I just, let's drop this maybe to uh, say zero five. So you can see a lot more oscillation and see it perfectly finds zeta. And when this is, uh, you might do that when you build your little simulation VI, which is part of the pre-lab. Just put some noise in there and see what it does to your estimation of zeta if you like. You don't have to, but that'll happen when you use the same VI. Practice with it here for the analytical solution, but then you'll use it when you uh, when you go to lab. Let's stop this. And that is all.